it came after a long period of sobriety. Then I found out the hard way that if you quit doing this, it gets bad very fast. You know? So it don't matter how much time you think you got. You got to remember every day who give it to you. Because I'm just going to be honest, before I start telling you my story, as soon as you quit being humble and grateful, you're going to get a new sobriety day. If you love it. If you love it. All right. Sorry. It's very interesting how I started drinking. I was 10 years old, and my first drink was given to me by my godfather. Afterwards, he molested me. So you would think that that would be imprinted on your mind that you shouldn't. I wouldn't want to drink, you know? <clears throat> I continued to hold on to that for a few months before I finally said something to my family. You know, and at 11 years old, I had to stand up basically on the stand, tell everything that man did to me. That was traumatizing. It really was. You know, they had to use the little damn stuffed dolls and all that crap, you know. The reality, though, is he got 15 years for what he did to me, which has helped me later on in the process of staying sober, as far as the forgiving part. Now, <clears throat> As I got older, I already never felt like I fit in, even though I was popular in school. And I played sports, all the most of our stories. You know, things we screw up by the time we get to 11th or 12th grade. You know, that's where I was. And I was the one that was a chameleon. I could fit in everywhere, anywhere. You know, I could fit in with the guys I needed to help me with my schoolwork because I wasn't that smart, and half the time I didn't go to school. You know, I hang out with the jocks because that's who I played sports with. <laughs> And then I wanted to hang out with the Peachers because they had all the good weed at the time, you know. And that was just the way it was, and that's how I began my drinking career in high school, <coughs> hanging out with them, <coughs> bouncing around. And once I started drinking full force, because, I mean, of course my story's got drugs in it too, but I was an alcoholic way before I ever did any kind of drugs. I drank like a fish. I'm full-blooded Irish. I'm just going to tell you that. I was bred to be a drunk. <coughs> My father was an alcoholic, my granddad was an alcoholic, every male figure in my family is dead due to cirrhosis of liver. And that's no that's not exaggerated. Even my stepdad, I guess we rubbed off in him. I don't know. You know? That shit <laughs> I told my mom, I was like, oh, mom, damn, don't hope don't never get nobody else in your life yet. You know? <laughs> but you know, even on my mom, my mom is an addict alcoholic. You know, so I grew up in that life anyway. You know, seeing it my whole life. So it was inevitable for me to start drinking. And I didn't realize why I drank, that I didn't feel like I fit in with anybody until I started drinking, then I didn't give a damn what you thought of me, you know? And then I wanted to be the party guy, like most of us, you know? And then it got to where I was drinking so much, man. I lived across the street from my grandmother who passed away last year. And I was 19. And I always came down the hill. I lived across the road and like down the hill to go check on her every morning, like nine o'clock in the morning. And she looked at me. She was like, "I don't never see you come down that hill without a beer." Here. At nineteen, at nine o'clock in the morning, that's not normal. You know what I'm saying? That is not normal. You know, to me it was because that's how I, that's how I dealt with everything. You know, I wanted to be known. I didn't want to feel that crap. You know, I had so much crap I didn't deal with just from issues growing up. You know, my dad not being there till I was 10, you know, the whole self-pity sob stories that we can blame everybody for what we've done. But once I started drinking, that was, that was it. That made me feel complete, man. It was like everything I did after that didn't matter to anybody except for me. That's how selfish it was. <laughs> and I drank like that to where I'm, I mean, no exaggerations, y'all. I could drink a case of beer like it wasn't nothing you wouldn't even know I was drinking. That's how bad of an alcoholic I am, you know? And it's sad to say that my wife got to see me sober for all in seven years, for two years or so, and then she got to see me get drunk. She got to see the half-assed decent Daniel, because I really wasn't doing nothing for my sobriety. Then she got to see Daniel in active addiction and alcoholism. Well, alcoholism first, because I drank for months before I did anything stupid, you know? And she looked back, I let her, Talk, told her about the three-part illness and the, uh, the progressiveness. 
And she started saying, I can see where you started getting worse, 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 worse. You know? And she's not even one of us. You know? And now she gets to see me as who I am now, which I hope I'm a little bit. It's not, not really. <laughs> but the fact is, is my drinking kept escalating, escalating, that I did nothing without drinking and drugs. Nothing. Nothing. And then when it came to, I was 21, I had just turned 21, and I was hanging out with a guy, like I say, mine's got a little bit of drugs in it, but this ain't really doing it. I was trafficking a lot of drugs. I'm just going to put it out there. You know? And my partner and everything was my best friend growing up, which he is dead due to this disease right now, too. He died two years ago. You know? Running from the police, imagine that, you know? What we do when we drink and drug, you know? But him and his wife had got into it, and we had been drinking heavily. Like I said, this was actually right before I started doing any kind of drug, really, other than just smoking weed. You know? And we start where well, he started drinking tequila. I, I'm a, I'm a, I can't handle tequila. I just couldn't say the word right. You know? I could drink one shot of tequila and be okay, but if I go to take the second shot, I'm puking up everything else I don't drink. It's just I just don't like tequila. You know? But I can drink vodka like it's water. You know? But and you know he, he was doing a little powder kind of and stuff like that. So it was like an all day drinking thing, and him and his wife got into it, and he pulled a gun. Man. You know, that's just the kind of lifestyle I was living. It was thinking I was damn Tupac or something, you know? <laughs> that's just what I grew up in, you know? I had to try to be a gangster. That was the way I just tried to roll, <clears throat> which didn't get me nowhere. Except for about 10 minutes after that, I grabbed him and we fell on the ground and he shot me point blank in the throat with a Ruger 45 B90. Point blank. There's some miracle on even standing here. Another long day I'm talking. And I'm, I think part of the blessing was is that I didn't know I got shot in the throat. <coughs> I thought I was shot in the shoulder because my shoulder went dead. My whole arm died. You know, I was like, I looked at him and said, now you dumbass, you got to take me to the hospital. You're going to shot me in the damn shoulder. You know? And then my little brother's in the back. He comes running out screaming and then just hauls ass out the door to go call an ambulance. Three houses open. There's like 10 damn phones in the house. It was, I guess he was just in shock. He went to like eight years ago, you know? But I got outside, it was a little chilly. It was around, it was October 15th, matter of fact. It was a little chilly outside and we were trying to get to my car where he could take me to the hospital and I couldn't make it. I fell out. Y'all, I remember pissing this shit on myself three times, dying. Three times. And guess what? Woke up a week later in the hospital. And as soon as they let me out, I went straight to the liquor store. Half a gallon of vodka, next door to the store, throw a pack of Bud Light, and a thing of V8. Vodka V8 is my favorite. Which will tie into my story in a minute. A lot of the guys already know that's here. But you would think that would be enough to tell me to damn quit. It wasn't. That's the only thing I know how to deal with anything, man. That was it. And then I'm going to go ahead and tell you today. I'm such a drunk, I wouldn't quit drinking, and they gave me Oxycontin, and all I did was get sick the whole damn time. I mean, literally, the pain medicine they gave me made me sick. I couldn't even take it, because I wouldn't quit drinking. That, that's crazy, you know? But I automatically know what's gonna fix everything. I mean, alcohol's my drug of choice, if you wanna say it like that. But later, I mean, it does lead me to other things later on, but that is my choice right there. I got to drink first. And it's just to make me feel, like I fit in, feel whole, and to be able to deal with stuff. Now, about a year later, I got busted, got put on probation, got busted again, uh, violated my probation because I could never pee clean, you know? And they sentenced me to five years. I did four and some change on it. Of course, I lost a lot of good time because I'm an idiot. You know, I decided to want to get tattoos in prison and stuff like that because I thought you were supposed to do that when you went to prison. You know? <laughs> hey, you know what the charge is for that? Destruction of state property. <laughs> and they took me to court for that crap. I was like, what? And the funny thing is when they caught me up, my tattoo was half done. So they took the tattoo gun, the, the drawing and all that, right? 
He takes me in there. He's like, well, I think I ain't going to take none of your good time because the fact is, is you only got half a tattoo and I got the drawing and everything. He said, by the way, let me see it. You know, I'm thinking I'm just going to get out of it until he says, let me see it. Pull my shirt up and it's done. He said, yeah, you just lost it three months. There you go, buddy. So that was pretty funny. He was pissed off. It wasn't funny to him. The thing is, is this whole time, I thought I was staying sober in prison too. But of course, you know, I, I have a lot of stuff wrong with me. So I didn't think I was abusing the medications and stuff like that, you know. That didn't count to me because, you know, I'm a drunk first. You know, that's my, that's my MO, I'm a drunk first. So I get out of prison and I, I don't even think I made it two weeks really. You know, all the years saying I'm never going to get drunk and high again. Never. I seen all these guys coming in and out of prison like a damn revolving door. I said, that's not going to be me. Somebody get out a year, they're back within six months. I mean, I, I said, that's not going to be me. I also said that about drinking and drugs, too. And within two weeks, I'm drinking, and I'm high. Thank God. Well, of course, everybody knows when you get out of jail. I mean, everybody wants to party with you. It's like a celebration that you're out of jail. Yeah, get you yeah. drunk, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> then you end up right back where the hell you came from, just about, you know? But I had a moment of clarity that allowed me to reach out to a treatment facility in Lynchburg. Of course, everybody knows the house now, where it originally was, or well, down in the boomies, you know? I mean, I probably would have left the first two weeks. I just didn't know where the hell it was. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, I didn't. Gene was there with me. Gene was my first... Commencement at the house, and that's honestly got me. I'll never forget that. He's a lot happier now, too. <laughs> but, you know, I went into treatment thinking I had a drug and alcohol problem, thinking I was going to be able to fix everything, family back, kid back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in reality, I found out I got a meat problem. And I've had a knee solution this whole damn time, you know? And then I come to find out that the reason I'm powerless is because of the disease I suffer from. Because I can I can honestly look at y'all, every one of y'all and I say, I ain't never done one of any damn thing. Anything, you name it, nothing, not one of nothing, you know? And when they told me that, you know, well, they, I tell all the time, man, when they told me I had that illness of the mind, it was easy. You know, that was easy, I was retarded or something anyway. Well, why do we do the crap we do anyway? That was easy to comprehend, you know? But when they told me I was allergic to drugs and alcohol, and they explained it, because you know, when you first hear about allergic drugs, like, mm, I'm not allergic to it. Unless you break out handcuffs like the joke, which you know. But, but when they told me what it meant, that phenomenon of craving, one drink, one craving, two, three, four, five, it multiplies, and that's why I don't ever stop. That answer, so much I could never account for. Why the hell would I be needing to go to probation, say I'm going to drink a drug a couple of days before because I'm going to be able to pass the piss test and then go straight in and fail right there. You know? It's because once I start, I can't stop. Because I am a true alcoholic of the hopeless variety. You know? And when somebody shared that, of course, it's easy for us to, the unmanageability part. I mean, shit, we wouldn't even be in meetings if we, our life was manageable. You know? If, if I didn't have outward consequences for my inward disease, I wouldn't even be here, you know? Because that's what brings us to our knees to finally reach out, throw our hands up and say, hey, I need help, you know? If it wasn't for consequences, I'd still be drinking and drinking probably, you know? I mean, every one of us probably would if you really think about it. It was the consequences that brought us. And I thank God for them. I thank God for putting me in prison for five years. Because if he hadn't, the crap I was doing, I'd be dead, you know? I would, I know it, you know? And I made it through, I commenced, I completed the program, I stayed here in Florence, I got a place right after because I was working two jobs. Oh yeah, by the way, I got my first job around 27 really, waiting tables at Western Susan. Put a convict like me, waiting tables, that was 10, 11, 12, a lot, I promise you. <laughs> Especially during the senior time. <laughs> But anybody <laughs> served like yeah. But it was humbling, man. I needed that. Because my pride was what was killing me my whole life. You know? If 
I'm a true believer if they rewrote the book of Alcoholics Anonymous right now, it would say pride is the number one thing. Because you affect my pride, I get resentful. And it's all so fast, we don't, none of us really think about it. You know? I care so much about what everybody thinks about me that if you piss, piss me off, I'm so worried about what y'all think and not how it affected me originally. You know? That's crazy. But that's how we lived our whole lives, at least me. I lived my whole life on what I thought you wanted me to be. And then I had to come to terms by doing the step work and find out who I am. I'll be honest, I did not like that at all. Did not at all. I did not like who I was. But the blessing is, is that I made it through it. And I came out on the other side and I was able to start using all the crap that I've done and all the crap that I've been through to help others. And that's the blessing, man. That is the true blessing. If you're not helping others, just be honest, you don't know what you're missing. Because when I get calls from people that I've helped, and that God's placed, in, placed me in their lives somehow or another, and they're picking up chips, and they're doing good, and they got their families back and all, hey, they ain't no higher drink that can ever replace them. Never. You know? And the humbleness I feel now is that coming up, you know, as they say, God willing, on four years in April, these three last year chips I picked up meant more than any of the seven I picked up before. Seven years I stayed sober off the first time. First white chip. I was one of the ones everybody wanted to talk trash about because I only picked up one white chip originally. Yeah, that don't mean shit. Right. You quit doing 10, 11, and 12. You quit helping people and start thinking you deserve some stuff or you're running some stuff and you're taking care of some stuff to get where you come from. That new sobriety day is waiting there. And more than likely, the progressiveness is going to have you do new stuff in your life too. You know? Me. Mine always started out drinking, like I said. I had a good job. I moved back to Anderson after I'd worked here a little while again. I made it two years and met my beautiful wife. And wasn't long, I'd say probably wasn't long after we got married, I started drinking here and there. Because I might not have been as alcoholic as I thought I would. Because I never really got in trouble drinking. I just never had a license. Never drove without a 12 pack or so in the car with me. And I, I just got lucky I never was in a wreck or anything killed anybody. That's what happened. You know? But I might not be as alcoholic as I thought. And boy, if I believe that line, I run right back into the truth that once an addict alcoholic, you're always going to be one. You ain't going back. So if you're as hopeless as I am, and you believe in this and you know that this is the only way, don't test it. Don't test it. Because I mean, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, it's probably going to affect some people. I don't care, but people are dying left and right right now. And I'm tired of getting phone calls. I'm sick of getting damn phone calls. And that's just the reality of our situation. It gets worse than ever better. And until we decide to open our arms and start reaching out more, we ain't gonna put it in this shit, man. We're not gonna put it in there. You know? We are the way the world's gonna change right here. Every one of us. Every person that God's put me in their life to help, I pray that they help somebody. Or help two people. And then them two people help two people. And then two people help. Because that's how we change the damn world. That's that's the only way. Time tested proven method. 1935. I say it all the time, man. If they invented a pill, I try two of the damn things if you could. I try to see what the second one did. You know? I, I mean, it's reality. I would. That's how it sounds about alcoholic I am. You know, first one could be the second one that I caused. I don't know. But if you don't do this and you're an alcoholic like I am, the end result's dead. Pain and misery for everybody you love. Possible, but death is a bigger picture because it's out of the you know. It really is. And if you don't believe me, just look at some of your friends' list and your contacts list. Because I was looking through mine about a week ago and I probably got 35 just on my contact list that's not here anymore. No that I didn't even realize I still had on my contact list. And then I backed up when I got a new phone, I backed they back, you know, the Google backup cloud thing, and they was 60 something. Y'all, that, I ain't had that phone number for three years. And 
I can tell you my numbers way up there, just because I've been around this program for going on 11 years now. And it ain't nothing like it was when I first got sober. Nothing. So the blessing now is, is like Devin said, I got to take my old job back to the extent here in Florence, get to know a lot of good people, get to see a lot of people's lives change, including mine. See God restore my marriage, which I should have lost when I relapsed. You know, there ain't no damn way she's be, my wife should be sitting here. There is no way. But the God of my understanding is the ultimate restorer. But you got to do the work for it to happen. It's not going to fall in your lap. It's not going to be easy. You know, that one day at a time. Don't blow that proportion. It genuinely is one day at a time. I get up. Do my prayer and meditation. Do what I got to do and pray all day long. And then I do my retirement at night. Say my little prayer. Every day. I got to. Because I found out when I don't what the end result of that is. You know? I had a sponsee of mine. He's a good friend. A lot of people's in here. I'm not going to say his name though. But I actually was one of his first sponsors. And he was uh, he's one of the chronic relapsers, like a lot of us. You know? And I'd always tell him, the last time I sponsored him, I told him, I said, I was like, you know, you got an experience I don't have that can save so many people's lives and avert them from actually going through what I had. Well, uh, the moment of clarity, I sort of called him for help, and that was the first damn thing he told me too. He said, guess what? You got that experience to help others with that. I like that asshole. You know? <laughs> so, I, I mean, don't, I guess that's the same. Don't piss your sponsors off. You might need them one day. But it's such a blessing to come back here because honestly, I think this is the first time I've ever spoke here as long as I've been coming in and out of Shady Group. You know? and I'm looking around and just seeing all the people God's put in my life over these years, man. I mean, I'm up here shaking. That's crazy. I mean, I took a five hour in the shop for a kid. 